Today we begin a new sermon series. Can you hear me now? Good. And the sermon series is Leviticus. When I say that we're gonna, I'm going to do a sermon series from Leviticus, how many of you go, yay! Most of you probably go, mmm, he's going, yay. <laughs> Most of you probably say, what is he going to do? We're going to preach, I'm going to preach from, for three years from the book of Leviticus. Does that sound like fun? Good luck. No, it's a short series called Men and God. It'll only be five messages long. Today's number one. Then we're going to go into something that will be a lengthy series with many series in, in the middle, of, but not in Leviticus. <coughs> Sister, you want to come up? We have that mic. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I really felt the Lord put this on my heart this morning, and um, Pastor Sam said it was okay to share it, but really it speaks to me. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, and, yeah, 16. Therefore, do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And I know my personal struggle with vanity and outward things could mean anything. It could mean pain. It could be mean, mean something physical. But um, those things won't change until you start with the inside. Um, and I know that I struggle with that every day. Um, so I just felt encouraged, like the Lord saying, you know, put me first, and from the inside I'll work to the outer things that are causing you trouble or pain. So. With the well, orange, green. Green is good, orange is bad, red is really bad, just in case you want to know. Fortunately, pink is not on this. It's one of my favorite colors, har, har, har. Don't give me anything that's pink, thank you. I had a pink bedroom growing up for a long time. That was enough pink for a lifetime. Those of you who like pink, Lord bless you. Just don't give me anything pink. Don't play games with me. Some of you have a wickedness. It means you have Nino in you. <laughs> the book of Leviticus is one of the five books of Moses. You have the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings and how God created the earth and all was good. Sin came into the world. Then he set aside a group of people called the Israelites to have a relationship with them so he could show people what a relationship with God could be like. The book of Exodus is how he delivered his people from Egypt and sets the stage for the Passover and how we come to Christ through the blood of the Lamb. And in the beginning, at the end of Exodus, it has parts of the law. The book of Leviticus is the law. The book of Leviticus was given to the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai. And it doesn't have story in it. It is the law. It has two primary purposes. Through it, God was showing the people how to live a holy life. So that's why it's so detailed. Secondly, he was showing the people how to worship God. I'm going to read you Leviticus 8. No, not to bore you to death. But how many of you have never read the book of Leviticus? Never read the book of Leviticus. Book, the book of Leviticus is one of those books that when I read through it, there are places where I skim. You know, it, the thing you should plan on doing is the rest of your life read from the Bible. And read, a lot of times people will start in Genesis and die in the books of Moses and never read the rest. If you're a new believer, start in the New Testament. But you should read through the Old Testament in the New Testament on a regular basis the rest of your life. Even if it takes 10 years to get through the Bible, when you get through it, then go through again. But there are places where you skim, but if you'll keep going through it, there will be times when God shows you things in the most surprising places. Because all of it is the word of the Lord. <coughs> John Bondo, some of you remember John Bondo. He was a missionary we supported to China. Now he's pastoring a church down in New York City. Saw him this week at District Council was coming in, running into a, either a service or a business meeting, and he had a few books, and he was, I just happened to pass him at the right time, he gave me the book. It's like, cool, I like books, I read. And yeah, I don't think he was searching for me, but the fellow, I can't even remember the author's name, he, had, he started a ministry called Burning Desire Ministry. And he makes a wonderful point. Many people view the Bible as... Man's attempt to find God or to, to pursue God. But the Bible, that's not what the Bible is. The Bible 
is about God's pursuit of man. Because He loves us so very much. And so as we get into the study of Leviticus, keep this in mind. It's about God's love for us. Why do we tighten up? We tend to think, <gasps> law, rules, right? Stringent, authority, yuck, tui. But that's not what this is about. It's about God's tender heart toward us. Leviticus chapters 8 through 10 describe an eight day ordination ceremony. That's pretty particular. The word anointed is used in here, and it means to rub, to smear as an act of consecration. They anointed with oil, smeared it on. But it, it, it represents a setting apart. The word consecrated means to be clean, sanctified, and made holy. So when someone's anointed, they're being set apart as holy, as sanctified, as being different, as being special, unique. What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? Well, I will tell you, and why am I dressed this way? I dressed up for you today. These are my work clothes. This is often how, if you're lucky, you'll find me coming into church sometime this way because I'm going to mow the lawn or play with something. And usually I'll have another set of clothes. But I dressed for you just especially for today. Past my wife's approval. All her color coordinated. She said it's good. If you'll stand with me, if you, if you cannot stand for four minutes, feel free to sit, stay seated. There are some people who... It's not healthy for them to stand for four minutes. If you can stand for four minutes, if you'd stand for the reading of God's Word, turn to Leviticus chapter 8. <coughs> I'm reading from the New International Version. We're going to read the whole chapter. I want you to hear how specific God is. The title of the message is, Coming to a Holy God. Coming to a Holy God. The Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron and his sons, their garments, the anointing oil, the bull for the sin offering, the two rams, and the basket containing bread made without yeast. And gather the entire assembly at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly gathered at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Moses said to the assembly, This is what the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. He put the tunic on Aaron, tied the sash around him, clothed him with a robe, and put the ephod on him. He also tied the ephod to him by its skillfully woven waistband, so it was fastened on him. Nice. He placed the breast piece on him and put the urim and thummim in the breast piece. Then he placed the turban on Aaron's head and set the gold plate, the sacred diadem, on the front of it, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and everything in it, and so consecrated them. He sprinkled some of the oil on the altar seven times, anointing the altar and all its utensils in the basin with its stand to consecrate them. He poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Then he brought Aaron's sons forward, put tunics on them, tied sashes around them, and put hand, headbands on them as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the bull for the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Moses slaughtered the bull and took some of the blood, and with his finger, he put it on all the horns of the altar to purify the altar. He poured out the rest of the blood and at the base of the altar. So he consecrated it to make atonement for it. Moses also took all the fat around the inner parts, the covering of the liver and both kidneys and their fat, and burned it on the altar. But the bull, with its hide and its flesh and its offal, he burned up outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Then Moses slaughtered the ram and sprinkled the blood against the altar on all sides. He cut the ram into pieces and burned the head, the pieces, and the fat. He washed the inner parts and the legs with water and burned the whole ram on the altar as a burnt offering, a pleasing aroma, an offering made to the Lord by fire, as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the other ram, the ram for the ordination, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Moses also brought Aaron's sons forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. Then he sprinkled blood against the altar on all sides. He took the fat, the fat tail, and all the fat around the inner parts, the covering of the liver, both kidneys and their fat, and the right thigh. Then from the basket of bread made without yeast, which was before the Lord, he took a cake of bread, one made with oil and a wafer, he put these on the fat portions and on the right thigh. He put all these in the hands of Aaron and his sons and waved them before the Lord as a wave offering. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar 
On top of the burnt offering is an ordination offering, a pleasing aroma and offering made to the Lord by fire. Now, when you take bread and you put it on meat and you burn it, and there's blood there, <clears throat> what does it make you think of in the New Testament? Eric Peck said a sandwich. <laughs> How about communion? The bread of life. Also, it was his blood, and it was a real body. He also took the breast, verse 29, Moses shared the ordination ram and waved it before the Lord as a wave offering as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood from the altar and sprinkled them on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and their garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and their garments. Moses then said to Aaron and his sons, cook the meat at the entrance to the tent of meeting and eat it there with bread from the basket of ordination offerings as I commanded, saying Aaron and his sons are to eat it. Then burn up the rest of the meat and eat the bread. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed, for your ordination will last seven days. What has been done today was commanded by the Lord to make atonement for you. You must stay at the entrance to the tent of meeting day and night for seven days and do what the Lord requires so you will not die, for that is what I have been commanded. And finally, in verse 36, So Aaron and his sons did everything the Lord commanded through Moses. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I ask for your anointing to preach this message, that my words would be pleasing in your sight. Anoint our ears and our, our minds, Lord, our hearts, to hear what it is you're saying to the church today. We ask that you give us your spirit without measure, Lord, in Jesus' name. Bind the forces of darkness that would keep people in bondage. Pour out your spirit through whom we have liberty and freedom. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You can be seated. Oh. Somebody like to catch? Joe Charbonneau raised his hand in the first service, and you should have seen before I threw, there was a clearing out around him. <laughs> you really want this, Maria? I'm not sure that I can throw it that far without hitting the wall, so you better stand up and be ready. Very good. <laughs> oh, no, she threw it back. <laughs> Did you notice how it felt? No, we're not going to do that again. <laughs> Thank you, though. She caught it. Good throw. If I may, you didn't throw like a girl. You had a good throw, right? I'm sorry. That was, that was not meant to be chauvinistic. But, you know, she threw well. Anybody can throw a football or a baseball. Did you notice something funky about it? Yeah, it's not full, but there are no openings. Would you check it, Brianna? Or do you see any holes or openings? No holes or openings. Like a lot of people who go to church. Looks good on the outside, but empty on the inside. Oh, does that relate to what sister read? To what brother spoke? Looks good on the outside, but empty on the inside. And it's no gadget. It came out of my mom and dad's house after my dad passed away. Some of you know that story. Why, why, why? When we, why do I bring that up? When we read this chapter, aren't you grateful you don't live in Old Testament times? Church would smell like a meat locker. You all would be covered with blood and oil. And I suspect that's not a great combination. You'd smell a little bit. You'd have to wear certain clothes, eat certain food, eat it a certain way. I wore this just this way to show you God doesn't care what you wear today. Coming to a holy God doesn't depend on the food we eat. I don't care if you're vegan, vegan, vegetarian, if you're a carnivore, if you eat junk food, if you don't eat junk food. Right? And I hear, I hear Christians criticize other Christians for how they eat. Back up. Coming into the presence of the Lord and approaching a holy God is not dependent on what we eat or how we eat. It's not dependent on what we wear. He doesn't care if I'm wearing my work clothes. Yesterday I was covered with grease. Aren't you glad I didn't come that way? You wouldn't want to shake my hand. 
I don't like greasing things. Zerks and grease guns, I wear it. Anybody know what I mean? As soon as you take a grease gun in your hand and you try to grease Zerks, anybody in here ever grease a Zerk? Oh, come on. You people don't work for a living. Good Lord. Would you stand up if you've greased a Zerk? A Zerk is a grease fitting. It's a little ball with a hole in it and you put the end of your grease gun on it. Yeah, now how many of you have greased Zerks? Yeah. They're little miserable contraptions that some person created. No, you guys need a special prayer. Lord, anoint them and give them favor with their grease guns and Zerks. Amen. God doesn't care how you dress. And the reason I bring it up is 60 years ago, you came to church, women were wearing bonnets, hats, men were wearing ties, wearing sport coats, and sometimes people came to church and they didn't feel comfortable because they didn't have those things. Folks, I don't care how anybody dresses, please not in the birthday suit. That has been out since the Garden of Eden. Right? So, I don't care what, as long as they have clothes on, they can come. Doesn't need, they don't need to be clean. God doesn't care. That's not how we find entrance to the Lord. And so many times, we base entrance on the Lord to a checklist. If I don't drink, if I don't smoke, if I don't swear, if I don't watch these movies, if I don't associate with these people, if I don't go to this place, if I do this, this, and this... I'll be acceptable to the Lord. False. False. Ain't so. Oh, did he just use that word? You're right, I did. And I'm an English major and I know it's wrong. And it didn't bother me at all. God wants us to come to him. The reason Jesus came, the reason we have the book, The reason we we are having church is because God wants us to come to Him. But we cannot come to Him as we are. We can't. The only time you can come to Him as you are is that first moment when He calls your name and you believe Him in faith. That's the last time you can come to Him as you are. That's salvation. He'll take anybody, anytime, anyplace. He draws you, you believe, you receive the Spirit. You're born again. You're a Christian. You have to follow him. At that moment, everyone's level at the cross, and they always are from that moment on. Anyone ever go to see someone in the hospital who had uh, their, their immunity was low? How do you have to dress when you go in to see someone who has low immunity? Put on a mask. You put on a gown. You put on gloves. Why is that? Because you have contaminants on you. You're, you have contaminants on you and in you. You are a contaminant. You can kill them. God is a holy God. You can't kill God. But he's a holy God and in him there is no sin. There is no darkness. He is light. We are a contaminant to him. He will not allow us into his presence as we are. There's no way we can get there. But he wants us to come to him. In the book of Leviticus, why, why did he create Leviticus? Why did he give... The Hebrews, all this law, and so detailed. You know, you've got to cook it this way. You've got to eat it that way. You've got to wear it this way. You've got to do it that way. Why did he do that? Just because he wanted to be hard to live with? It's just like marrying your mother-in-law. I need to get saved. My mother-in-law wouldn't be that bad. I wouldn't have married her. I believe it was for this reason. If you follow the Hebrews out of Egypt, every step of the way they were hard people. They were grumbling, they were complaining. No matter what God did for them, they always wanted to go back to Egypt. They always cried out and said, you hate us, you're going to kill us. He did kill some of them, they deserved it. But for the most part, he wanted them to enter the promised land. He just got so sick of their grumbling and complaining. They were hard-hearted. And I think he was trying to show them through the law how much work it is that how far short of his glory they fall. There are two reasons for the law the New Testament tells us. One, the law shuts us up. When we hear the law, we can no longer justify ourselves and say, I'm a good person. 
We know that it is impossible to obey the law. If you try to obey the law and still get through without being a grumbler, go ahead and do it. I'll meet you on the other side. We'll say a confession of prayer and repentance on the other side. There's a second reason. The law was given according to the New Testament so that we know we're sinners. And hence the detail. What's that look like though for us? God wants us to come to him. Leviticus is there not just to shut up mouths, not just for the people to get a clue they're sinners, but there, there are evidences to the truth and how we approach God. And it's a combination of three things. They come in order. You can't have one without the other two. I could say, I'm going to approach God this way. I'm going to take three steps, wave my arms, turn around in a circle and wave my arms. That's a combination. If that were the way to God, you'd have to do all three in that sequence. If I take two steps, wave my arms, turn around and wave my arms, it won't work. Combination doesn't work. Just like a combination lock, right? I don't use a key, a lock with a key anymore in my shed because we lose the keys or things happen and so I have to cut them off or I have to cut the handles off, so I use a combination lock now. It takes three numbers in order, dialed the right way. There are three parts of the combination entering God's presence. And some of you are saying, Sam, it's simple to enter God's presence. It is. And it isn't. If you want shorthand, write straight out of the Scripture, the three combination, parts of the combination, the three aspects, pieces of the combination. Blood, oil, and obedience. Blood, oil, and obedience. But let's look at that in detail. It's really, blood represents death. That's the first ingredient. That's the first part of the combination. It's death. We come to God through death. Jesus' death. We know that because animals had to be slaughtered. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice to end all sacrifices. But He had to die. It's His blood. Folks, we have to accept what His blood does for us. We cannot approach a holy God if we're not... And so even the person who doesn't know Jesus... No matter what he, she, or it has done or is doing, in order to come to the Holy God, they have to come through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. There is no other way to heaven. End of story. Jesus is exclusive. He poured out his life. He said, Buddha won't do it. Allah won't do it. Paganism won't do it. Wicked won't do it. Your universalism won't do it. There's only one road to, to Jesus, to God the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. End of story. He's the only one who died for everyone. Accept it or don't, but that's the fact. And if you don't accept it, you'll go to some place nobody wants to go to, and you only have this life to determine it. You only have this life. Once you take your last breath, it's all over. If you confess Christ and you believed in your heart, you'll enter His presence. That's simple. If you haven't, you'll be rejected because you've chosen to reject Him. Yes, I'm being passionate now. It's the fact of the matter. And you know what? People who haven't gotten a clue yet, they need love and compassion, but there comes a time when you draw a line in the sand and you say, this is the truth. Believe it or don't, but I'm going on. Because I'm told to scatter and I don't know who's being drawn and who's not. By the blood of the Lamb. But Jesus' death is not the only one that's required. Did Sam just say that? You're darn right I did. Three of the Gospels have this. This is really complete, Luke 9, 23 through 26. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What do you think taking up your cross is? It's a willingness to die to yourself. We heard Rich Wilkerson, a cousin to David Wilkerson this past week at District Council. He said our ego, you know, that's, that's our pride, our ego, folks, edges out God. The bigger our ego, the smaller God in our life. The smaller our ego, the bigger God in our life. God's the same size. It depends on how much of Him we're allowing in. Less of me, more of Him, good thing. More of me, less of Him, bad thing. That was grade school. Accept it or reject it. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Please listen, because this is of utmost importance right here today for people. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. 
What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. When we, we, we accept what Jesus' blood did for us, we accept his death and his resurrection, but in order to have relationship with him, that requires lordship. Romans 10.9. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Lordship is, not my will but yours, less me, more of you, Lord. I have to die to myself. Folks, I have to tell you, this is really fun. This is really fun. This is one of those moments when I get to share with you my story, and there are times when it's not comfortable. You know parts of it, but not together. I went to Lansing. And so in Lansing, you were accepted if you were a good athlete. And that just, you know, wasn't the case. So the way I defined myself and the way I pursued life, I needed to succeed. And so I chose to pour myself into my studies. And I was basically a straight-A student. The last year that I, my graduating year, when a lot of people's grades, their averages begin to go downhill a little bit because they get interested in other things or pursuing college, my grades went up. And actually, I climbed up in the top ten in my class. You know, grades were the way I was succeeding. And then I, then I pursued writing. And so, okay, I get to be in college, but I'm, I'm pursuing writing. And folks, that was how, that was me. I needed to succeed to feel good about myself and to feel like I was worthy of anything. Not because my folks put it on me conditionally. They loved me as I was. But for me to be happy in life, I needed to succeed. It was in grades and then it was writing. In writing, it was good. I had two writers that I worked under who were professional writers. One earned a living, became the writer laureate or writing in, writer in residence, I think they're called, or something like that in North Dakota for the whole state. Two of them said... Send out this story, different stories. One of them said, send it to the New Yorker to the care of this editor and tell him, I told you to send it to them. Won two awards. Received Christ in the midst of that. And he showed me, you know what? People pursue success. They pursue what they believe. Because I want to be a writer. I want to write the great American novel. The problem is when you write a good story, you have to write another good story. The demand for success never stops. It's kind of like a ruthless marriage. The person you're married to expects you to be perfect, and when you fail, there's no contentment in the home until you're perfect again. I know marriage is like that. Fortunately, I'm not in one of those. I was convinced that in order to be a successful writer, I was going to probably suffer but not as we talk about it as Christians. Many writers suffer alcoholism, drug abuse, because they're so introspective. You turn yourself inside out, and you get weird. And I told Penny, you before I asked her to marry me, you need to know that a lot of writers have these issues. You ask her, and she'll tell you I said that. But you know what the Lord has done? He said, that's you, Sam. That's you. You have to die to yourself. He helped me understand that my greatest joy and contentment is not in great grades, not in writing the great American novel, not in being the best pastor, not being the best preacher. Not that you don't strive for excellence, but folks, when that is our passion, we forsake a lot of things that we shouldn't. It becomes an idolatrous thing so that we're worshiping for it, we're living for it, Excellence can become an idol, folks, if you're not doing it for the glory of the Lord because it becomes your glory. We need to do it for God's glory. And so he's, over the 30 years I've been walking with him, he's brought me to a place where it's, you know what, that pride, that ego has got to get shrunk, Sam Bob. He's helped me understand it's more important that I serve him as he wants me to without any glory and to serve you. Whatever your point of need. 
And it's not about me. And you know what? I have to die to self every stinking day. Because there are times when something rises up in me and says, what about Bob? It's like, it's not about me. It's about him and his work. And there is no... Some of you could hear this and say, well, you're, there's an empty place now. Folks, if you're going to serve Jesus and you're tender-hearted toward Him, and you're willing to do His will, and there are people right now who you've got to surrender and let the walls down and let Him in completely, because you haven't. You're doing it based on your negotiations and your criteria. And you only go so far with Him. But here's the story. The real truth is, the more you die to self, the more you experience His tenderness and His joy. You cannot have intimacy with God and receive your own glory. The more you die to what you want and you follow Him and you do what He wants, the more you experience a joy that is hard to... And I just, I'm growing in understanding of it, but I'm not there yet. The first part of the combination is through death. Coming under Jesus' death, His blood, but dying to self. And that's not negotiable the second one, you look at verse 13, I'm not going to right now, mentions blood and oil together. The oil. What's the oil? The Holy Spirit. Anyone who's been in church at any time understand, understands that the oil in the Old Testament and the oil in the New Testament in the book of James represents the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> 1 John 2.20 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Romans 8.11 adds to that understanding. See, our anointing now in the New Testament is the Holy Spirit. The oil that we anoint people with just represents the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through His Spirit who lives in you. We receive the Spirit at the moment of salvation. When we are willing to say, You're Lord and I'm not, please come into my life, the Spirit comes to live inside us. In that moment, He gives us life. Prior to that, we're living and breathing. We're trying to succeed. We're trying to overcome things. We're, some of us are depressed. Some of us are joyful. But we are not alive to God. And in the moment when we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside us. We are made alive to Christ. We now receive new desires and a new consciousness that, you know what? That really was wicked. But God has forgiven me. See, a lot of times we know we're wicked and what we're doing is wrong and we're condemned by it. But when we come to Jesus and under His blood and receive the Spirit, we see it, we feel liberated from it. The only way to escape addictions and to come clean and really have victory is by beginning a relationship with Jesus and continuing the relationship with Jesus. But I have even better news. He gives the Spirit without measure. Luke 11 says, If any of you wants the Spirit, ask, and the Father will give it to you. He will give you. I didn't know this until I started attending here. 1999. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a separate experience from salvation. When He immerses us in the Spirit, and He will give it to everyone. Everyone. What holds us back so much of the time is doubt and fear. We fear, well, I don't want something to take me over. Don't worry about the devil. If you're asking for God, God will just have a tunnel between you and him. Don't worry about the devil. Number one. Number two, it won't be you. The sign that we've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in this church and in the assemblies, and I believe scripturally, is speaking in tongues. God won't take you over. He doesn't make you... You're, People will say, oh, I don't want it to be me. I don't just give it a rest. Relax. Begin to praise the Lord with your mouth. And if something foreign comes out, it's not you, it's God. And the enemy will come the next day and say, that wasn't you. Folks, if it's God, you'll experience joy and a greater sense of intimacy as you speak in tongues. It's not going to be you. It'll be him. And it won't sound like anybody else's. They all sound different. It's the Holy Spirit praying through you. It's a heavenly tongue. 
and you'll know the intimacy of God. And folks, that intimacy, when I, 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 if you've received the gift of praying in tongues every day, you'll know the intimacy of God in a deeper way than you ever have before. What you thought was sweetness when you were saved is immersion in that sweetness just to a wonderful level. And He empowers us for His work. And I have to tell you, as I've walked with the Lord, you know, I've been pastoring 12 years, saved 30 years, baptized in the Spirit since what? Fall of 99, however many years that is, 16. This is what life is like today. And on an ongoing basis, God reveals to me. Now, this is intimacy. God reveals to me my depravity. Well, here's pride, Sam. Had a tough night this week at a service. I was cranky. <laughs> and I knew it. The next morning, the Lord came alongside me gently. And I repented of my sin. I have to tell you that as he reveals these things to me, and I repent and I, I'm, I say, I, I want, just want more of you, Lord. Show me whatever you need to. I know the tenderness of the Lord in a new and deeper way than ever before. When you draw near to God and you say, I want more of you, Lord. Do whatever you need to. Get rid of everything in me that's not right. Do whatever you want to. See, that's part of intimacy with God. He will show you but it doesn't destroy you. It brings you into a greater tenderness with Him. And I can't explain it. The tenderness that I feel in the Lord, His tenderness toward me and His love and compassion is more powerful now, more real, more tangible than it's been in 30 years. Has it always been fun? No. It's not pleasant when you realize this, is, this part of me that I'm used to is not right. And I'm getting tired of it. And I'm frustrated with it. Get rid of it, O oh Lord. But as you tenderly come to the Lord, His love is poured out in you in a way that's wonderful. The last ingredient is obedience. And I would dare say that's submission. John 14, 23 through 24 says, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize obedience and submission in this way. It's not this. It's not a checklist of don't do this and do do this. It's not a checklist of I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray every day, I go to life groups, you know, I invited you over for supper, I invited you over for breakfast, and I said, God bless you. I did my checklist, and so now I can approach God. I'm all good. I've obeyed him. No. Some of you, it's a list of to do, not to-dos. Well, I didn't smoke. I didn't swear. I didn't drink. I didn't watch that stuff on TV. I didn't cuss at the guy down at the four-way stop. <laughs> it's not those things. In essence, submission and obedience are these. Seeking to do the will of God. And when you realize you've fallen short, agreeing with Him, and being tenderhearted toward Him. And continuing to walk with Him because He just fills you with His Spirit. It's really loving the Lord and wanting to please Him. And as He shows you when you make a mistake, embracing Him, and you'll get a father hug that just lifts you off the ground with joy. See, revival is going to begin in a moment like this. Revival is probably not going to come when worship is at a high point like it was last week in second service. That's not how revival is going to come, people. Revival is going to come through a closer relationship with Jesus as we become more aware of 
what we really are in his great love for us. I think that's how revival comes. It starts with personal revival in, in our individual lives. May the Lord help you understand what I mean when I say the tenderness of the Lord. To summarize, we choose his blood. We choose to deny ourselves. And in that moment, we receive the Spirit who gives us new life. We can ask for more of his Spirit, and he will give it and give it and give it. And he helps us to live with him in a way that pleases him. In a way that's tenderhearted, it's like with your spouse or with your kids. You seek to please them and take care of them. And sometimes there's conflict, and when there is, we resolve it. And it's not always my way because a relationship is too important, folks. That's what it's, and then you have an ongoing sweet relationship with the person that just gets better and better. That's the way it is with God. 